If it feels like you're leaning, it's not your computer. It's my craptacular tripod. Uh, I snagged another job for the township. Got to fix this old plow truck. It's a 2003 International. It's got the front plow and then it's got the wing on here. And it's set up for spreading salt. Anyway, got a couple of simple X marks the spot type jobs. So the plow frame is cracked through right here. This drag link from the pitman arm back to the, the steering knuckle is worn out, needs to be replaced. And then one that's going to be a little more difficult. He says periodically, if they shut it off at night, come back in the morning, it won't start. And it cranks and cranks and cranks, just won't, won't light up. They've had it to a few other shops, they put some batteries in it and maybe a few other parts. And quite a few hours I think have gone into troubleshooting it, they haven't gotten anywhere. So, I don't know how far we're going to get with that. He told me specifically he doesn't want to spend, you know, two or three days trying to figure it out. And it could very well take that. This is a DT-466, and I believe in the 2003 that would have the Huey injection, more or less like my, my pickup truck that maybe you can see back there, the Power Stroke engine. And I know from experience that the, the Huey injection it absolutely will not start without a decent battery or a good battery. If the, if the cranking voltage drops below like 10, 10 and a half volts, the, the injectors won't fire and you'll never get them started. They'll crank and crank and crank, but they just won't go. And I'm here to tell you that solving an intermittent parasitic draw on a cabin chassis truck like this, that's possibly the most difficult electrical diagnostic job you can ever have. I mean, where do you even start? We can find a wiring schematic for the, the cabin chassis, but all this crap that's been added on by the body installers, who knows? I haven't looked inside of it, but I'm sure it's chuck full of fuse taps and scotch locks, and you know, we could spend a month of Sundays trying to figure that out. So let's see if it'll start, get it inside, and go from there. And it started right up. That'll be fun to fix. Well, you think you've got a big shop until you put one of these trucks inside. Anyway, I guess we'll get to it. I don't know what's going on with this truck. He says they just went through a state inspection, but I noticed that the air dryer is purging every, about every 30 seconds. The ABS lights on on the dash. So I'm assuming that they didn't pass. Anyway, I'll have to talk to him about those various issues, but we'll get to it, fix that drag link and the plow frame, and we're going to have the batteries unhooked anyway to weld, so we'll just hook up the amp meter and see if there's something going on with those batteries. But I don't know, that could be a, a real wild goose chase. Well, I'd say we could spend a few days fixing oil leaks too. It's been sitting in my shop for, I'm not kidding, less than five minutes. Got a spot there from the main lift cylinder. This swing cylinder is leaking so bad I had to put a drip pan underneath of it. And it looks like the engine is leaking from the front, the middle, and the back. So, yeah. Anyway, things to note on the invoice. Well, doesn't that look like fun? There's a 100 amp fuse. Just a wonderful pile of unhooked connectors and various harnesses anyway it's got a battery disconnect switch so I guess we don't have to do any work oh except it doesn't work well this plow frame it's actually made of two pieces of angle iron welded together and this one here that's broken is actually a continuous piece it goes all the way from this end around the bend here and all the way to the far end but right here where it's broken, it's actually, you know, it's pushed out a little bit. And it's also, it's got kind of a, this thing going on. So what I'm going to try to do is pull it over with the binder and we'll, we'll tack it real good here on this corner. And then we'll get creative with some jacks and see if we can straighten that out a little bit. It's not going to be perfect because it's like they've really kind of done a number on it. And the 
the angle iron here is actually bent back beyond 90 degrees and the whole thing's kind of tweaked down a little bit so we can't really fix that but we can try to straighten this out the best we can. Well, if you're going to weld half inch plate, it's usually helpful if you put the welder into high range first. So let's try that again. Doesn't look too bad. It's a little bit too big of a project for my little Miller Matic. I probably should have should have grabbed a bigger welder. But two passes, I think it'll be just fine. I did a, a root pass and a whatever you want to call it, st stringer or top pass, and I did weld it on the back and the bottom side. I won't make you guys watch me weld overhead out of position. We'll try to keep the video family friendly, and I know I got her good and hot because that. Doesn't hurt right now, but I bet it will later. Anyway, I'll let this cool off while we eat some lunch and we'll move on to the next project. It's not straight. Maybe you can see it on the camera. Still has a bit of a, a bow to it. It's actually straight right here at the bend in the angle iron, but the rest of it's kind of all been out of whack. So this is the spot that takes the most beating because the plow you know, the plow is more or less straightforward right now, but normally it would be angled this way so that it can plow the snow off towards the, the right side of the road. So that's the spot where the thing rides all the time. So of course it's going to get the most wear and the most hits there. So I'll talk to him about it, but I don't think it's going to be worth my time to try to straighten that thing. I mean, it doesn't really matter. So yeah, good enough. I don't think we can plate it either. Now we might be able to plate it over here on the back side, but we can't plate we can't plate here because of this shoe that it rides in. So, so on to the next one. I've got about about an hour into this, so that's not too bad. We'll have to take a look at this drag link. It's this piece right here, and just turn the steering box a little bit. Yeah, so you see it down here. So that joint is foobar. Well, it sounds like the whole steering shaft is goofed up. And it's got a U-joint out of it too. Oh well, we'll just fix what we're told to fix and we'll note that for the next time. Hey, these nuts are looking pretty mean. I don't think we'll ever get these cotter pins out of here. Probably just have to cut them off. Yep. We're gonna replace it anyway, so we shouldn't have to worry about drilling those out. Okay, put a jack under it and turn the wheels a little bit. Before we get too carried away, let's just make sure. Yeah, it looks right to me. Okay. So. 
three quarter inch drive impact on these. It's an inch and five sixteenth socket. Well, now the tricky part. We're not reusing it, so we could pickle fork it. Because, you know, we don't care if we destroy the boot, but... All right, a little bit of heat and the other one popped loose too. Sorry, it's a little bit tight in there for me, a hammer, a crowbar, and you. Same process as the other one though. Heat up the knuckle a little bit, push the two apart with the pry bar and then a good whack with a hammer and usually that'll do it. So a lot of people think you gotta hit down on top of the nut or the you know, top of the ball joint, but usually it's best if you hit on the side of the taper. That'll bust that taper loose. Okay, pro tip, don't get too Anxious to throw in that new drag link. You got to give these these arms a chance to cool down So if you can spray on whatever kind of liquid and you're still getting smoke, it's too hot So if you go jamming that new link into that taper while it's still hot, you know, the next guy's gonna have Quite a time getting her apart and he'll have to heat the thing and beat the thing like I did so Just give it a minute to cool off Yeah, let's give her a little never seize for the sake of the next guy, because it'll probably be me. And this won't affect its so this won't affect the you know the, the taper holding or anything like that. It'll just make it easier the next time we take it apart. There's plenty of mechanical strength there to keep her together. All right, let's try that. This is how the old one was put in, so I don't know. I guess it's right. Okay, tighten to factory spec or until a cutter pin will fit through, whichever comes first.
And I'll just sweep it through its turn radius here and make sure nothing's hitting. But I think we're going to be okay. So I'll try to show you guys this. This is the first joint in the steering shaft, right where it comes out of the firewall. And there's a U-joint there. Can you guys see that? She's definitely pooched. So I'll have to write that up and see what the customer wants to do. Probably it never got greased. You see it does have a grease jerk, but nobody ever remembers to reach up there and grease those. Okie dokie, let's take a look at this parasitic draw and we'll see what we can figure out. It's gonna be a pain just because there's so many different things that are all kind of hooked up together. All right, we're gonna put the meter on DC amps and then something I like to do, whenever I'm using the amp setting on my multimeter, I just unplug the, the factory probes and I plug in a different set of probes. That way, you know, hopefully when I go to use it again, I'll unplug the probes and I'll remember, hey, I need to turn it off of amps because be my luck, I would jam the thing onto a 480 volt AC circuit and smoke the fuse. And the little fuses in here are quite expensive. So I've got all the grounds hooked together. So I'm gonna go right off the battery and we're gonna clip this to the ground. They're all, like I said, hooked together. And we're gonna hope that there's not more than 10 amps here. Because 10 amps is all the little multimeter can handle. Okay, so it's got about half an amp right now. So all we can do right now is wait and let the, the computer and the modules and all that jazz go to sleep. And we'll check back on this thing in about, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes or an hour. So the meter is going to automatically power off. That's fine. It doesn't matter. The circuit here is still going to be closed even though the meter is not showing anything on the LCD. So we'll be back. <laughs> Almost, pup. Okay, it's been about 45 minutes, so let's just make the meter up here. Okay, so we're down to about 118 milliamps, and that's too much, in my opinion. Anything over about 30 milliamps is too much, as far as I'm concerned. So it's always going to draw a little bit. There's probably, you know, like a clock and a radio that draws a little bit of, of power, and then there's an engine ECM that probably has some Keep Alive circuits, and... I think this is an Allison, so it probably has a transmission ECM that takes a little bit of juice. But anyway, that's that's too much in my opinion. So now the real head scratching starts. And actually before I fired up the camera, I unhooked the alternator and it didn't make any difference. Uh, you know, a bad relay in the in the rectifier bridge in the alternator will definitely cause a an amperage draw like this, but that's not the case here. Something else is going on. So, I guess we're going to have to figure out what it is. Start pulling fuses or something. The thing is, we got to be careful not to pull pull the fuse on something that's asleep because as soon as we put the fuse back in, it's going to it's going to pop our amperage back up to that 500 milliamps and we're going to have to wait all over again. So, it can be a very long process. I let the truck sit overnight. Came in this morning. Check the meter, about the same, 120 milliamps. I did figure out where it's going. It goes through these two wires right here into this module. International calls it the I don't know, service controller or something like that. It's basically a body control module. And anyway, I got a chance to call the dealership this morning, talk to one of their guys. He told me that according to International, anything less than 250 milliamps is an acceptable parasitic draw. And actually, on the newer trucks that have more modules, it can be as high as 500 milliamps. So, given that, I don't think there's any reason to chase this down any further. Uh, like I said, the truck starts and runs fine for me. I started it up this morning, no problem. 
I did go and load test the batteries with the carbon pile tester. They're both fine. Check the alternator. It's putting out 60 amps, so no problem there. Now look at that fancy repair. I even put some paint on it. And I did go ahead and put a, a little fish plate on the back side, so that should be nice and strong, and these fellas are ready to plow. All right, folks, I think that's it. We're going to ship it. I feel bad leaving you hanging on the no start issue, but we can't reproduce the problem. And if we can't reproduce the problem, then I don't think we can fix it. It's always started just fine for me. And we did chase that parasitic draw issue for a few minutes, but I don't think that's the problem. Something else is going on and it just hasn't, it hasn't happened for me. So I think what I'll do, I'll just keep in touch with this guy and I'll tell him to let me know when the problem occurs and maybe I can sneak down to his shop and we can do some testing, you know, try to catch it in the act. And yeah, that's all we can do. So thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.